If you have a Bible, you can turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 18. If not, no worries. The verses will be on the screen behind me, and we are going to jump into the Christmas story. And it goes like this. This is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Verse 20, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife because that kid, I know, I know you think that kid is Peter's, that kid is Paul. She didn't do you dirty, Joseph, I promise you. That kid is of the Lord. She, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and she will have a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And the angels dropped into the auditorium today. The title of today's message, I want you to turn to one of your neighbors and give them my title. Tell them, it's not what it looks like. <laughs> it's not what it looks like. That's it. Now tell the other neighbor, the one you ignored, tell them, it's not what it looks like. I didn't mean to ignore you. I just have an instinct. I have a neck thing. Makes me go that way. It's, it's not what it looks like. Last week, someone at church anonymously dropped off two presents for my boys which I thought was so kind. I didn't ask, obviously, I never do, but it was a kind gesture. After scanning them for explosives and anthrax, we <laughs> then proceeded to hand them to our kids, and on the car ride home, they were so pumped, they were so excited, because they just, they were imagining what could be inside those boxes, which is really half the fun of Christmas, isn't it? the boxes, because anything could be inside, and you're filled with anticipation, and you're filled with expectation and excitement, because who knows what's in there. This is the point of wrapping presents. It's a little bit of excitement. Unfortunately, every once in a while, somebody comes into our life that does not understand the purpose of wrapping. They will either not wrap the present and just give it to you, which is awkward and weird. Thank you, I guess. <laughs> or, or They'll do, they'll do one worse. They'll wrap it, but they'll wrap it like this. <laughs> Gee, I wonder what it could be. <laughs> What's even the point? First off, terrible present. Don't you ever buy anybody a pan for Christmas, okay? S secondly, if you're going to buy me a pan, at least put it in a box so that I can have 15 seconds of excitement before my disappointment at finding out that it is just a pan, right? You'll get a present like that, or you'll get a present like this. <laughs> just why? Just why? Why would you get a chair for somebody for, for Christmas? And if you're going to get them a chair, why, why put it and wrap it? Like, it's obviously a chair. And, 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 and sometimes in life, you know, things are like this. Like, they are exactly what they seem. But, but other times, you get presents. Like, I remember this present I got. I remember the first time I got this present. I was so sad. I was like 10 years old. And my grandma at Christmas gave me one of these. Now, to be honest, my expectations of grandma's presents were not high. She often bought me socks and pajamas and underwear and things like that. And so the year that I got this from her, I was like, oh, great. She really took it up a notch. <laughs> Went from underwears to words. Appreciate you, grandma. But then my mom, my mom who knew more than me because I was just 10, she nudged me. And she was like, you're going to want to open that envelope. I was like, I'll read it later. <laughs> She goes, no, no, you're going to want to open that envelope. And so I opened that envelope. And anybody who's ever had a grandma knows that when you open that envelope, yes, sir, that 20, bro, Andrew Jackson in the house. I saw this, I was like, this is a great present. I was right at that age where we started to transition from gifts to money. How many people know what I'm talking about? It was a good present. It looked basic, but it was awesome. I'm trying to build my sermon on this premise, okay, that in life, sometimes, most of the time, the things that come into your life are not what they seem. Yes. 
Although we need to be honest, sometimes things are exactly what they seem. Like if you dating somebody and they got no job, they living at home with their mom, they don't got no education, none of that. Don't you look at that and think there's an entrepreneur in there. Uh-uh, girl. That's a chair. And it ain't going nowhere, you ain't taking it. Come on, somebody. Fellas, don't be coming at me talking about, the, if the only thing you can say about her is that she's hot. Get it? Hot? If that's the only thing you can say about her, you might want to think twice and, and ask yourself, do you have a relationship or a utensil? Because people are not created to be used, they're created to be loved. And you keep messing around, you're going to burn somebody or burn yourself. So there are times in life, you know, when it's exactly what it looks like and be paying attention. But there are other times in life, and I would say the majority of the times in life, where, where it's just not what it looks like. And of course, my, my point isn't that we should judge based on appearance. In fact, I'm trying to prove the opposite, that on the contrary, we should never judge by appearance and we should never judge by feeling. Please don't judge by feeling. There are things that come into your life. There are certain people, certain presence, even certain problems that we cannot judge just by what it looks like or how it makes us feel. Withhold your reserve, your judgment. Listen to me, until you look inside. Until you look inside. You might not know what it is. This is a principle for life, and I want to apply it, if I may, to the Christmas story, because the Christmas story has been wrapped a thousand different ways, in a hundred different movies, and a hundred different songs. But what I would like to do today is unwrap it. I'd like to unwrap it and challenge maybe some of the preconceived notions that we have about Christmas, that we have about God that we have about life, and I want to even challenge some of the preconceived notions you have about yourself today. Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, it's not what it looks like. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her. Disgrace? We got Jesus and we got disgrace. You know what blew my mind that I never noticed before, James? This is the book of Matthew chapter one. This is the very first reference to Jesus in the entire New Testament. We hear about him in Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, all the books of the Bible in the New Testament, we hear about him. The first time we hear about him, catch this, I hope this, and the thought of him creates shame. Joseph thinks about Jesus and he's ashamed. And as I meditated on that thought, it occurred to me that in 2,000 years, not much has changed. There are people who have come into the room today, maybe you're like Mary, you're a single mom. Maybe you're a, a divorcee, or maybe you're like Joseph, you got a secret that you hope nobody else finds out about. And if that's like you, and if that's you, me and us sometimes, then walking into a room like this can be very challenging because when we walk into a room like this, we start to feel the shame. We start to feel like we don't measure up. Jesus is so good and perfect and it incites and inspires some shame in our life and we want to just run away. But if that's you today and you came to church and someone had to fight you here and you feel guilty, let me encourage you, it's not what it looks like. This place is not what it looks like. You got to keep reading. Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. She's going to have a son. His name's going to be Jesus, and he's not going to shame you. He's going to save his people from their sins. If you're taking notes, you can write down my first point. Jesus didn't come to shame you. He came to save you. He came to save, and it's a big difference. Hey, and this isn't just good news for the people who are coming to church for the first time or the first time in a long time. This is good news for the Christians who have stopped coming to church and just don't know it yet. The quiet quit, Christians. Not because you want to leave, but because you've been making choices lately that make you feel like you don't deserve to be here. Like somehow the bad version of you and the choices that you made disqualifies you from the Christmas story. And I came to tell you today that no matter your condition when you walked into this room, new believer, been a Christian for 30 years, just coming to figure this thing out, that your condition and your choices do not disqualify you from the Christmas story. Your condition and your choices are the reason we even have a Christmas story. 
It's the reason we even have one. Like, let me tell you about the lights. One of my favorite traditions in Christmas is the lights. I, I love the, the Christmas lights. Did you know that there's symbolism behind the Christmas lights? We see lights all over the Christmas story. We see the star in the sky hanging over Bethlehem or Jiskon, as the kids said in the video. We have the angels who came to speak with the shepherds with a flashing light. The purpose of light the, the light in the storm, even, even the uh, winter solstice, which is the reason why we celebrate Christmas on December 25th is not because we believe Jesus was born on that day. In fact, he most likely was not born on that day. But that day was picked because it was a rebrand of an actual pagan holiday, which some people get upset about that. And they're like, well, you know, the, 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 the people who worship the devil celebrated December 25th and they took it and they made it special. And then we took that. And I'm like, yeah, okay, but God made days to begin with. So, so really the devil's the one who took the idea and twisted it. It all up and so but the reason that day was picked is because it was a day where they would celebrate the darkest night the winter solstice is the darkest night in the world why would you pick the darkest night to celebrate the birth of christ because there's a message that jesus comes to meet us in our darkest moments not only that but the day after the winter solstice once the winter solstice is done every day gets longer and longer and longer as time goes on in other words when jesus came into this world he brought with him hope for a brighter day oh the world feels dark right now i don't know if anyone knows what i'm talking about but i want to encourage you that in the middle of this darkness there is a light there is a light and so i brought some pictures of some christmas lights some houses that i thought were really cool here's one i thought this was really neat that's beautiful i mean you got lights on the house you got look at that angel just floating up there in the corner that's, you got even lights on the grass. That's beautiful. There's another one we got. This person chose to go multicolor on the next one. Yeah, this is a Latino for sure. He went with all the colors. He didn't do the white ones. He went with the multicolor joint right there. That looks nice. I like that. Now, this next one I thought was just funny. It's not really. That's hilarious. <laughs> that's funny. I don't care what you say. This person knew what this person was going to do, and they were like, I'm with him. We live on the same block. We both get credit. <laughs> he said, ditto. That's the most Christian Christmas design I've ever seen in my entire life. I got to be honest, as much as I love the house on my left, I, I'm definitely the house on the right. I'm not going through all that work to decorate lights outside of my house. I got Jesus in my heart. I don't need him on my house. You know what I'm saying? I, I got this. I'm okay. I'm good. No, but I, but I, I mean, I don't like him. I like him. My only problem is around this time of the year, I don't sleep well. I don't sleep well because I need it to be pitch black dark when I sleep. And my neighborhood has a Christmas light decoration contest, <laughs> which I wouldn't mind because not every house in my neighborhood participates, except the guy who has won it three years running and happens to live two doors down from my place. Right through my, through my bathroom window comes shining the glory of the Lord every night. I don't know what time it is when I wake up anymore. I'm all messed up, right? But I don't, I don't come knocking on his door in the middle of the night because I'm upset at him. How dare you shine your light? Are you trying to irritate me? Are you trying to annoy me? Are you trying to anger me? I don't do that because I understand that the purpose of the lights are to spread joy. I understand that the purpose of the lights are to remind us of the hope that we have in Christ. I'm only upset because I was sleeping. The only people who get upset when the light turns on. See, when you come to church, the lights turn on. The lights turn on on your relationship statuses and the, the lights turn on on your mental health and the lights turn on in the financial status that you're in. And the only people who are annoyed by that are the people who are sleeping. And if you're sleeping, I just want to encourage you, church should not come to attack you or your way of life or your lifestyle. Church should not come to judge you or make you feel less than. The lights are not there to annoy you. Let me help you. The lights aren't there to highlight the dark. The light is there because it's dark. It's because you're wrestling. It's because you're struggling. It's because these other areas of life are not as they would be and you know it. So it's time not to run away from the light, but to run towards the light. If you're in a relationship and you've got a secret that you've been holding on, to, confessing that secret might feel like shame, but let me encourage you, confessing that secret, it looks like shame, it feels like shame, but it's salvation. It is what will save your relationship in that honesty and transparency. If you're here at church today and you have thoughts of self-harm or you've wrestled with some form of suicide ideation, 
getting on that hotline and letting somebody know what you're going through might feel like shame, but let me encourage you, that phone call, that reaching out, that can literally be salvation in your life. It can save your life. Fight through the shame. Reach out to somebody. Let them know what you're going through. It's not shame. It's salvation. And when you talk to God and you tell him, I don't have it all together and I'm not perfect and I've got issues, but I need help, that might feel like shame. But I promise you that it's salvation for your soul. When you confess and are open, he meets you. And then one day, the thing that you were embarrassed about, you will be proud about. The thing you used to hide, you will flaunt as a testimony of what God did in your life. You know, the Bible doesn't really tell us about Joseph. We hear about him in the beginning, but we don't hear about him during the life of Jesus as an adult. We don't know if he passed away. We don't know if he's just in the background and the authors chose not to highlight him. But here's what I can imagine, that if he was alive while Jesus was alive, doing his miracles, boy, you better believe he was proud, huh? Come on, I'm proud when my kids can make breakfast. Can you imagine Joseph's pride when Jesus is out there opening the eyes of the blind and raising the dead? Joseph was in the background talking about, that's my boy. That's my boy. Get him, Jesus. Yeah, the same Jesus you were trying to hide 30 years ago. Now you're praising him and lifting him up because the thing you were embarrassed about, come on, somebody, is the thing that got turned around, flipped, and now you can show the world, this is who I am. This is what happened. This is what was God did in my life. Let's continue with the Christmas story. It's not as it seems. Luke chapter eight, Luke chapter two, Luke chapter two, verse eight to verse 16. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were so afraid. I can't read that and not do the Charlie Brown voice while I read it. <laughs> verse 10, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you and he is the Messiah, the Lord. If you have no biblical background, let me invite you into the beauty and the weight of that word, Messiah. It's loaded. It's not just a word for Jewish people living at this time. This was a promise. This was a person who would fight for them. This is a person who would overthrow Roman oppression and government. This is a person who came to eradicate sin and who came to bring judgment on all evildoers and who came to bring health and life and kill death itself. This is a heavy, heavy weight. And this is the person that they've been waiting hundreds of years for. And now he's about to tell the shepherds, <laughs> the angels are about to tell the shepherds, and this is what your mighty deliverer, this is what your mighty savior, this is what your king of kings, this is what he looks like. Are you ready? Verse 12, and this will be a sign from you. He looks like a, a, a baby. A what? A baby. Well, how's he going to pick up a sword if he's a baby? Wrapped in swaddling clothes. Swaddling cloths? Do you know what swaddling cloths are? They didn't have huggies back then. Wrapped in a diaper. So how's he going to clean me up if he can't even wipe his own butt? I don't understand. And he's going to be lying in a manger. But how can he stand with me if he's lying down? A baby, not a warrior, wrapped in swaddling clothes, not a robe, lying in a manger, not sitting on a throne. He looks small. He looks helpless. He looks dependent, which is cute for a baby, but not for a defender. For a defender, for a savior, for a warrior. This is the only word I could think of. He looks puny, tiny, not enough. But I came to encourage you today. It's not what it looks like. Jesus isn't puny. He's patient. He's patient. I can't tell you how many times in my life God has seemed small. There was a day my son died. There were the months our church went without a building or a place to meet the church that God supposedly had called us to start and launch, not to mention the years I spent with the secret addiction and the on and off again battles with my mental health. But then I remember that Jesus came as a baby and not as an adult. And that comforts me because God could have sent an adult. Did you know that? It was his plan. He could have wrote it up that way. He could have sent a 33-year-old. Christmas Day could have been the day when he saved the world, not just when he came into the world. Ooh, but catch this. Had he saved the world on Christmas Day instead of entering into the world on Christmas Day, then he would have created the false expectation that transformation can happen overnight. But he didn't. He took 33 years to complete it, to set the model that transformation is the process of a lifetime. That's so good. It takes your whole life. 
to be different. God took his time. I'm gonna bring you back to Sunday school. I'm gonna take you to Bible college a little bit. We have a word for this in theology called the doctrine of identification. It comes from the book of Hebrews where we say that we do not have a God who cannot relate with us. We have a God who can empathize with us because he was as we were, tempted in every way, fought every struggle, had every trial, yet was without sin. So that when we pray to him, we're not praying to somebody who doesn't understand how our life was. He went through our life so he can say, oh, I know I've been there. I got that. I went through it too. And because I got through it, you could get through it. If God had saved the world as an adult, then he would have never experienced a childhood. If he had not experienced the world of his childhood, then he could not help heal the wounds of your childhood. You think you got bad parents. His parents left him at church (laughs) for three days. I see some of y'all trying to leave your kids at Journey Kids. You better go get them. We will call the police, okay? You better pick them up. Three days. He needed to come to earth because when Jesus was in heaven, all he knew was a perfect father. So he had to come to earth to experience an imperfect one so that he could walk with you through your parents. Jesus had to come to earth as a child so that he could live through the teenage years. He had to be a teenager. He had to be a teenager so that he could relate to every teenager going through puberty. That's right. I don't know how you think of your savior, but my savior went through puberty. He had it hard. You got to imagine that he was negotiating with God on that one. Like, come on, man, do I got to do it? Can I, I'll come as a baby, but not a teenager. I'll put on the diapers, but I'll hold the pimples. You know what I'm saying? Can we? And God told Jesus, no, you need to go through it so that when that 12-year-old cries out, so that when that 14-year-old cries out, so that when that 16-year-old cries out, they know that they have a God that understands what they're going through. <laughs> Jesus had to spend his whole life creating lifelong friendships so that he can relate to you when lifelong friends turn their back on you. By the time he hung up on the cross, he had experienced the gamut of human emotion, human pain, human suffering, and human trial. As he hung on the cross to die, they shouted at him, come down from there. He said nothing, but he could have replied, I did come down. That's why I'm here. Don't be fooled by this flesh. Don't be fooled by these wounds. I know I look puny, (laughs) but come back in three days. You're going to find out real quick. I'm not puny. I'm patient. I'm waiting. I got a plan because when I do it, I do it right. And if this is the way that God treated his own son, what does this mean about the way he's going to treat you and I? God is not in a rush because more important than finishing to God is growing. Our goals are not God's goals. Our goals are to finish, attain, achieve. God's goals are are to grow, develop, refine, to make better. It's different. I learned this recently when I I tried baking. Now, y'all know that I have been on a baking journey now for about two years, and I just need to tell you right now, don't ask me to make you things. I'm not good. (laughs) I'm an amateur baker, not even an amateur baker. Whatever a half of an amateur is, I'm that. The level before that. My kids got me this dough for Father's Day, so put it on. This is my, my apron, all right? Let me put this on real quick. And um, just so you know, I, this came with the apron. I don't use the bottle opener. <laughs> it just, it came with it. I don't judge you if you use the bottle opener. Just saying, that's not mine, but it's mine. <laughs> and uh, I tried to really impress my kids the other day because it was Christmas, so I was like, hey, we're gonna make gingerbread cookies. Have you ever made gingerbread cookies before? Raise your hand if you've ever made them before. A couple of people know what I'm talking about. Everyone else, I'm about to take you for a ride, okay? I had no idea. Listen, I had the people. I got all four members of my family together, so we're going to do this together. And then I had the picture. I went on the, on the web page, and I got the recipe. And then because I had the people and I had the picture, I thought I could make a promise. And so I came in with my promise. And my promise was today, family, today, we will make, design, and eat gingerbread cookies. That was my promise. And then I started, and it all fell apart. (laughs) First off, I had no idea. I did not have all the ingredients. I didn't know just how many ingredients 
You needed for gingerbread cookies. I had cooked cookies before. I had the salt, I had the sugar. I thought because they're gingerbread cookies, maybe I should have a couple other ingredients in the house. So I did. I had that in the pantry, cinnamon. You know it's gonna have cinnamon. Um, I had uh, ginger, okay, because you thought you know it's gingerbread, gonna have some ginger in there. And then I bought some vanilla, because it seems to be in every recipe. So I got vanilla. I had cinnamon, ginger, vanilla. I opened up the recipe and there were things on that paper that no one has in their pantry. First one was molasses. Who got molasses just laying around? You got molasses? Not me. I did not have molasses. I had to go to a farm. I'm just playing. I had to go to the store, got me some molasses. And then after that, they said they needed cloves. I don't know what cloves are, but I, got, I bought cloves that, that was not sitting around. And then it was nutmeg. I don't do nutmeg in my coffee. Who, I don't know what this is, I just, but I bought the nutmeg. Then it said baking soda, which I've never used baking soda in baking before. I thought the baking there was just for fun. I thought this was poison. Like if you ate this, it would kill you. This, my mom used this to clean sometimes and you don't eat from the guy with the arm. And so I had no idea that that was in there. Then it came time to make the icing and it said one of the ingredients I needed was cream of tartare. What in the world <laughs> is tartare? And how do you cream it? And if it is a cream, why am I looking at a powder? So many questions. So many questions. It's a cream of tartare. But I put that. So listen, so it took me a day to get the ingredients. There's one day gone right there. <laughs> then after I got the ingredients, I made the dough and I thought it was like cookie dough. You put it in the fridge for 20 minutes, you start baking. Uh-uh. Gingerbread dough needs four hours up to overnight in the fridge. Sorry, kids. Dad messed up. We'll pick this up tomorrow, day two. Then we get there and then we start making the icing. Turns out I had the wrong powdered sugar. Icing tasted like soap. I had to go buy more powdered sugar, different powdered sugar. That's day three. Day four, this was supposed to be <laughs> bake it, design it, eat it in the same day. We're on day four right now. And now I got the icing and now I got to decorate. So I'm getting ready to decorate, but by that point, I'm so upset, I'm so frustrated, I'm just, and so this is the last remaining gingerbread man. This is a legit, it's one I made. Don't laugh when you see it. Hey. Did you zoom in? Are we zooming in? See my cookie? Come on now. <laughs> this is not good. It took me four days to do this. Listen, Jesus came back to life in less time. Then it took me to make a cookie. I'm so mad. You know why it came out like this? I had the people, I had the place, I had the picture, even had the pieces, but I didn't have the patience. If you don't have patience, you can have the right pieces. You can have the right picture. You still won't produce what God's called you to produce in your life. And the reason I'm wearing this, this best dad ever t-shirt is not because I'm the best dad ever. I'm not, but I know the best dad ever. And the best dad ever is also the best baker ever. And let me tell you something about him. Number one, he's not gonna start cooking until he gets all the pieces in the right place. Some of us have ambitions and goals and dreams and we're halfway through and things are starting to collapse and we're mad at God, you're so puny. He's not puny, he's patient. There's a reason you weren't supposed to start yet until the pieces get there. Because God knows that if you start halfway through without having all the ingredients, you're gonna throw away what was good because you don't have what it takes to complete it. Let me tell you how many people have ruined their marriage, not because they were in the wrong person. They had the right person, but they rushed it. And they didn't have the pieces in their character and in their mind to sustain what would have been God. Don't rush it. God's the best dad and he's the best baker. You know why I had to let the dough sit for four hours up to overnight? Because and I'm sure you know, Rob, but gingerbread dough, it's very soft. So if it doesn't stay in the fridge for long and you try and build with it, it crumbles. Ooh, God told me to tell you, if it's easy to bake, it's easy to break. Yeah. So what am, I, what am I trying to tell you? I was in my addiction for 20 years before God delivered me. Was he puny for 20 years? Mm -mm. But because it took me 20 years, when I finally got out, I wasn't gonna go back because it had taken me 20 years. If God had me in the fridge for only 20 minutes, my delivery would have crumbled. My freedom would have fell apart. 
This is why you still wrestle with anxiety because by the time you do come out of it, it would have been so long that you were in it, you will never go back again. And you're not gonna have the same habits and the same, the same things that get you there. No, you are leaving it behind. Now and forever, now and forever. He's the best, best dad and best baker. Sorry, it's my ear. It's all good, it's still there. Let me give you the last part of the Christmas story that is not what it looks like. Matthew chapter two, verse 13, after the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. The angel said, stay there until I return to you because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. This is the day, this is days after Christmas. Now there's a hit out for Jesus by King Herod. And I wanted to highlight the word after. Somebody say after. Because it's all good when you're in it, it's after. Hey, the wedding and the honeymoon is great, but after, when you gotta actually put in the work to build a marriage and not just a wedding day, the day that your child is born is beautiful, but the teenage years that come after, that's a little harder to navigate. That's almost harder than it was to give. Giving birth is pretty hard, so I've heard. But for, for, for y'all ladies, that was over in a couple hours. You got years now. If I, Christmas, some of y'all been celebrating Christmas since Halloween. I know it's awesome, but isn't one of the saddest days the day after the lights come down, the music stops? Some of y'all, some of y'all keep your lights out till March. <laughs> Let us sleep. You drive down the street, you get, the sidewalk is littered with dead trees. Sad after. It's sad after. And then it don't matter all the presents you get, it didn't matter because none of those things fill the void that you felt. And now, even though it's after Christmas, now you feel like you felt before, which is the thing about after. After it's done, you often feel like you did before. One more report, Matthew 2, 14. That night, Joseph left for Egypt. Somebody say Egypt. What was Egypt? Egypt was the place where the Israelites were slaves for 400 years. Jesus' his people, isn't that crazy? After Christmas, he's going back to a place where his people were before. I'm trying to talk to somebody who feels like they would have been past this by now. And you're in a season right now that you're like, I thought I learned. I thought I grew. I thought I developed. I shouldn't be wrestling with this anymore. I shouldn't be struggling with this anymore. Why am I going back to this place? Why am I going back to this place? I got a good word for you. His mother. And they stayed there. Put that verse back on the screen. And they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken to the prophet. I called my son what? Mm, so I'm sending him to, but on the day I send him to, I'm already prophetically declaring, I'm also bringing you out. Somebody needs to hear this today. You're not going back. You're going through. You're going through. Let me make this simple. I don't know who needed to hear this, but somebody needed to hear this today. It, it don't rhyme. It, it, don't, it don't go with anything that I was talking about as far as words in the sermon, but th I needed, the Holy Spirit told me somebody needed to hear this. You are going to come out of this. Somebody needed to hear that today. I come to tell you on behalf of God, you are going to come out of this. You don't have to stay. You don't have to stay. Do not choose to stay in that season any longer. I joked about those people who got their Christmas lights up till March. You know, some people have their Christmas trees up all year. So sad. I have some pictures of it. Look at this lady. That's beautiful. That's a Christmas tree. And it's a beautiful Christmas tree. All right? When December 25th is done, if you want to push it till New Year's, cool. You want to push it till New Year's Day, cool. First week of January, cool. But she pushed it all the way to February. She said, you know what? I love this tree so much. I'm going to do a Valentine's Day tree. She's going to keep this thing up. And then after her Valentine's Day tree, she did a St. Patty's Day tree. Let's just keep this thing going all year long. After the St. Patty's Day tree, she did an Easter tree. That bunny would freak me out. If I wake up in the middle of the night and see that bunny in the living room, I will karate kick. <laughs> but it wasn't enough to have the Easter tree. After the Easter tree came, the Cinco de Mayo tree. Come on. <laughs> You got the tequila bottle right in the middle <laughs> and the maraca on the bottom. And what enough to, after the single demile trees, you got the 4th of July tree. Yeah, nothing to go with fireworks like a flammable tree. After that, 
pray for them. They got a Halloween tree. Listen, some of you might look at this and think that's cute. To me, that's depressing. Let it go. It was great. It happened. Let's move on. You know what? This might seem like depressing to you, but let me tell you what encourages me. Hey, this encourages me. I'm not no Scrooge. I'm not, I don't humbug. I don't hate Christmas. This just encourages me because it reminds me that I don't have to stay in a season forever. That seasons change and whatever was doesn't have to be always. It can come and it can go. Let me show you how this works. If you were with somebody last Christmas and this Christmas, you see two people making out under the mistletoe, don't get triggered. Don't get jealous. Don't start hating. Just take the memory of that relationship you had last year and you go, you know what? That was very nice. I'm glad I had that person in my life last year. I'm grateful for them. Thank you for them. But that was last season. Here you go, Jesus. You take that because that was last season. And I'm coming into a new season. I'm coming into a new year. Hey, if you got that crazy family member, you know what I'm talking about, Aunt Carol. Aunt Carol always talking your ear off. Or you got that mom or that dad you always fight with. Or that brother that every Christmas, he always says something and always starts a fight. Can I just tell you, whatever happened back in the day, it's time to put it away, y'all. Your family needs to come together. It's Christmas. It's time to heal. It's time to restore. Whatever drama you had, put it away. Get together with them. Have the conversation and give it to Jesus. I'm done with that season of hate. This family is going into a new season. Hey, and if the devil tries to keep you stuck in what you did last month or last week, and he tries to label you, and he tries to call you names, you just let him know, "Uh uh-uh, devil, that is who I was, but that ain't me any longer. You can take all those actions. Put them in the box. You can take all your hate. You can put it in the box. That's not me anymore. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the reason I can say that is not because Jesus took down a tree, but because Jesus came down from a tree. And when he came down, he took death down with him. And he took sin down with him. And he took shame down with him. And he took depression down with him. And he took anxiety down with him. And he took loneliness down with him. And he took brokenness down with him. And he took emptiness down with him. And he took hurt down with him. And hate down with him. I don't got to hold it no longer. I don't got to live it in no longer. It's a new season. It's a new year. I'm not staying in who I was anymore. God's got something better for me. I'm moving forward. Take it, Jesus. It's yours. I'm not staying stuck no more. I'm not staying stuck no more. Stay standing. Stay standing. Stay standing. I want to do two prayers before we close today. First person I want to pray for is a person who is stuck in shame. No more. No more. This place is not here to make you feel guilty. If you got something going on, the lights will turn on and it might irritate you, but it's not to kill you. It's to wake you up. And it's time to throw shame behind you. So the first people want to pray for is anybody who's wrestled by by shame. It's time to allow Jesus to come into your heart, take all that shame away. I love that song that we sang, Hark the Angels Herald say, He was born so that we can experience second birth. New life, y'all. It's coming. Every head but every eye closed. If you're in this room today and you are far from God, but today you want to put shame behind you. I'm going to pray for everyone else, but real quick, if that's you, on three, shoot your right hand high. Say, Jesus, I need you in my life. If that's you, on three, shoot your right hand. I need you in my life, Jesus. I'm saying bye-bye to shame all over this room. On three, one, two, three. Would you raise your right hand high? Come on, push shame behind you. Push I see your hand. 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 My God, Father, 12, 15 hands. Praise the Lord. Hey, listen, whether you raise your hand or not, put it down, and I want everybody to pray this prayer out loud with me. Jesus! I know I'm empty, I know I made some bad choices, but today I put all those things behind me. The devil wants me to think that I'm no good, but I tell the devil today, it's not what it looks like. I'm yours. Today I receive your forgiveness. Do away with shame. I give you my life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And amen. Come on, put your hands together. Welcome to the family of God, all of those people. Hey, if you were one of those people who raised your hand, in the seat back pocket in front of you, there's a connect card. I'd love for you to pull that card out. 
fill out your information. We're not gonna bother you. We're just gonna help you take the next steps. We're not gonna, we're not gonna show up to your house or anything like that. We just wanna call you, send you a text and say, hey, how can we help you get started on this journey with Jesus? You can turn this card in in the black box on your way out along with your giving, or you can take this to the tent. But everyone else, I wanna do one more prayer. One more prayer really quickly. Listen, if you're in this room today and you feel stuck in a season, I want you to know today that the end of the year is not just the end of the year. It's a new season that is coming your way. You had to go through Egypt, but you're not staying there any longer. The old Jew is behind you. Get ready for new life. Get ready for new hope. Get ready for new dreams. Get ready for new passion. Would you pray for me? If you, pray, can I pray for you? Let's pray together. If, you want, if you're ready for a new season, go ahead. Just If you feel comfortable, lift up your hands, close your eyes, and just receive right now. If that's you and you need a new season to come over your life today, it's time to put it away. Come on, it's not what it looks like. This isn't just the end of a year. This is the beginning of a new year. This is the beginning of new hope. This is the beginning of new life. It's not what it looks like. Father, I give you my life. Father, I give you my future. Father, I give you, I I give you everything. And I ask in return that you would help, Lord. I believe that this season will not define me, that I am not stuck, that I am not trapped, but that new is coming, that better is coming. I believe that this next season is on the way, and I trust in you, Jesus, to do it. Do it in my life, Lord God. Hey, we're JJ and Liz Vasquez, and we wanted to say thank you so much for watching and engaging in today's content. Maybe today you made the decision to follow Jesus. We want to celebrate the incredible decision that you made. All you have to do is text JOURNEY to 55498. We would love to walk this journey out alongside you. Hey, don't let the journey stop there. We love for you to do one of three things. Either subscribe, share, or support. If this ministry has blessed you at all, subscribe so you don't miss out on any new videos. Share it with a friend, you never know what the people closest to you are going through. Or you can choose to partner with us through generosity, which helps bring these videos to people like you. Thank you so much for connecting with us. Be blessed.